uh, we are live. We can start. Hi, uh, I welcome all. Uh, welcome to see conversation of Winter Series 2024. I'm Malin Mahde. I, I teach here at school. And me, along with uh, my colleague, Dipti Bhandarkar, we are uh, moderating this winter series, which is titled Technological Practices Riyas. Uh, this conversation uh, series is organized by CCD, which is an outreach program conceived by the School of Environment and Architecture to organize conversations and dialogue in order to engage with larger architecture, artistic, cultural, discursive practice within and outside the city. C conversation series was started in 2014. It is uh, it is concluded fortnightly, and every semester we curate it around the theme which emerges from our current question and inquiries. For this series of winter 2024, uh, the conversation are curated around the theme of Riyaz and a long due questions. Riyaz involves a rhythmic engagement with self, the techno technological matter material as well as the world within which the practice is located. For us at C, Riyaz is a systematic way of practicing a form of an of an art or a craft with a long-term commitment to not just learning it, but also advancing the self and the form of practice in the process. It involves routine, discipline, engagement, isolation, diligence, play, experimentation, through which one arrives at and struggles with the long duration questions. This series is organized by CCT and is part, partly supported by Urban Center. Urban Center is a conceptualized as collective space. It presents a node for dialogue, ideation, deliberation to carry out research and communicate on urban planning, designing, conversation, and sustainable urban development. Uh, today, uh, we Which, which is research-driven design studio with an ongoing exploration of an Indian craft of weaving based in Hyderabad, India. It was founded in 2018. The studio is known for its extens expansive art installation, inventive fabrications, sculptures, and furniture that has tribalized the new design language for cane and ratan craft in India. For Priyanka, weaving is an art form, but also a way of material interaction and integration. It is a way of life and means of craft, but also it is a means of explore structural capabilities via material research. It is a, it is a small basket, but it is also a building envelope. The talk introverts woven morphologies via means of craft, communities, materials, scale of applications, and sustainability. Welcome, Priyanka. Uh, I will quickly uh, set the format of the session. The, uh, Priyanka will take us through the through her work about uh, 40 to 60 minutes, and then we will open for question and answers. Uh, uh, please put in your questions and comments in the question and answer sections on Zoom, uh, and we will get you in conversation. Also, this session is streamed on our YouTube channel. Those who have joined us there, can post their questions in chat and uh, we can collect them from there. Uh, I will I will join you at the end of the talk. So up to you, Priyanka. Uh, thank you, Mr. Milin, for um, having me here. Um, I'm grateful that I have this platform and the opportunity to be able to speak to you, to the students of the college and be able to express the idea of what Wicker Story is, the quantum of work that we have done in the, I would say the recent past, because we are barely like a five-year-old company, but also set in context what my larger vision towards Wicker Story and the idea of weaving is. So um, I would like to proceed uh, on the presentation. So um, here is something that kind of establishes the motto and our belief system. I think your beliefs, the core beliefs have to be very clear and very simple. And uh, what that states, states is that design is potential, design is power, and we can bring in change through design. 
Um, so, as I say in my slide here, that in design we believe. With design, we innovate and we have managed to innovate. And with design, we make lives better and we have been able to bring change. And it's a it's a journey that we have embarked on. It's based, barely been five years and we look forward to another many more years of work that goes into the whole practice and be able to bring change to innovation to creating better work. So a little background for me is important here. Um, I am an architect by profession. I started practicing architecture in 2010. Um, and for nearly five to six years, I did run my architecture practice. Uh, it's still running, which is handled currently by my partner, Mr. Kasi Raju. And um, Vicar Story, the company that we're talking about here, is actually, uh, uh, it, it started as a subset of Prelab Design Studio, where the larger goal was architecture. And we started working on different ideas of uh, maybe product design or tech-based design or, you know, experimental interiors, experimental architecture. So these were the things that we were working. And through those, we kind of embarked into this subset, which was called as Vicar Story. And over time, it became big, a little larger than life, and it became its own entity. So it separated, segregated from the architecture practice. Now, uh, this background is fairly important because it kind of establishes the thought process behind uh, why Vicar Story really, and I mean, why not just an XYZ company which sort of does wooden furniture, uh, metal furniture, or let's say, you know, 3D printing or something else. I mean, why specifically Wicker Story? Like, it's a, it's a very um, streamlined narrative. And uh, for us, it's interesting that though it's a very streamlined narrative, how did we start? How did we grow? And how far can that narrative uh, sort of uh, take us? So architecture is where we started. And I've, I have a background in architecture where I had done projects in residential and commercial uh, sector. I've also done a lot of interiors. Um, in the initial five years of my architecture practice, we also tried doing, you know, through different experiments, we tried developing products. Uh, I was very keen on um, 3D printing and design, uh, which happened also because when I did my master's in architecture, it was in advanced architecture from IAC uh, Barcelona. And um, in advanced architecture, suddenly, you know, we were moving beyond architecture. We were talking about the future and the future technologies uh, in the industry that were kind of revolutionizing uh, or on the journey of revolutionizing the, the intent of architecture, maybe intent in terms of design or manufacturing or execution. So during our masters, we were talking about uh, 3D printing at the scale of desktop printers or maybe at the scale of robotic 3D printing. Uh, we were talking about uh, sensor-driven design. We were talking about data-driven design. So that kind of set the foundation towards how I wanted to pursue architecture. And um, after having come back to India from uh, my master's, uh, we realized that the traditional Indian market does not allow you for a lot of experimentation because everything sort of is bound by limitations of square feet rates. And also as a young practitioner, it also becomes very difficult to find that right client who supports you, facilitates you with that larger than life vision and also facilitates it with money or sponsoring the project. So, Initial five years of practicing was trying to find um, my identity in as, as, as an architect, as an interior designer, but also we tried experimenting on these products, which at least gave us uh, an opportunity to say that, hey, let's experiment on 3D printing on just a jewelry, which is like a small product, and assess how the production to the economics of production to taking a product into the market, how all of that happens. So this was sort of one of the companies that we set in between and uh, realized that we did not want to do jewelry, but you know, 3D printing still kind of enticed us at that particular point in time. 
uh we also um one second we also uh, worked on um, sensor driven uh, a couple of sensor driven art installations where the intent was that we experiment with art pieces and then can these art pieces can these techniques of um, moving components sensor driven it could be sen uh, uh, sensor sensor driven through the aspect of maybe touch or data can transform so the idea was on a larger scale maybe smarter building envelopes where the building envelope sort of moves and sh uh, changes uh, shape to adapt to better um, um solar needs or better um uh, ventilation needs in the building so we would keep experimenting on smaller things and think of that larger vision where things could be applied now uh, having done uh having worked on a lot of things we realized that um one of the largest one of the biggest problems with these experimental designs especially at the level of form based intervention form based innovation was that uh we could um generate beautiful 3ds we could generate very uh, uh you know very experimental works which were form driven but the moment things came to the execution of it we were failing most of the time because either the projects never had the money secondly uh, there were no right agencies in the market who could undertake the execution for the project so we realized that at at the scale of architecture um uh, 3d geometry is is a concern from sustainability point of view from economic point of view plus aspects of 3d printing which is entering into the market right now but it was not present uh, uh, uh at, at least 5 to 10 years back when we started so by 3d printing i mean 3d printing in cement or clay that could actually be a viable architectural solution uh so at the same time we said that how about uh, designing complex uh, you know using grasshopper rhinoceros to actually design complex geometry but uh, just dial back and go a little low tech in terms of how we pursue the manufacturing of it so uh, that is how we we did our first product i'll i'll come to that first product the journey of that first product is quite interesting but we started with that product in 2018 and uh, we started uh, when we bought the product into the market um, we did not know if they're going to be takers but uh, the next one to two years took us by a surprise we were there in all the top exhibitions around the around the country we were welcomed with open arms and we realized that a humble material like uh, uh cane and rattan weaving which you see mostly on roadside shops by you know being dealt by smaller uh, my, very uh, disorganized sector in, in in the country that kind of a material could have takers in the really high end design uh, uh, marketplace uh, and that's what gave rise to with the story and it's been 5 years and uh, we we're constantly trying to push further what uh, we uh, like each time with what we create so um uh, this slide kind of sets the premise for why we stuck around the idea of uh, with the story uh we wanted to innovate for a for a long time we always thought that tech had the solution for innovation um and this one experiment where we were trying to create a complex geometry like a beautiful shape we realized that it was giving us an opportunity in craft innovation something that we would always address as an old and outdated market uh, around us now um the the diagrammatic representation on the right which are these 3d geometries is essentially it it, it essentially kind of tells how a surface a 3d surface is made so a 3d surface has two directions that define its coordinates and points which is the u and the v direction now uh, when we did our first product we understood that a uh, weaving uh weaving in in cane and weaving in rattan is actually a warp and weft uh, system where material sort of goes into perpendicular directions and uh, uh, movement in these in 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 uh, the u direction and the v direction actually could help us 
develop very, very complex uh, geometries and shapes. And it was quite interesting for us because we, at that point, we were, when we started off, we thought that 3D printing is the only solution or maybe CNC or laser cutting is the only solution for us. But we realized that uh, a basic understanding of how geometry is made on the drawing board um, and taking that and sitting with a weaver and a craft person, somebody who's worked for the past 30 years and brings in that skill and knowledge on the table. I think this this for us for the Eureka moment and said that, OK, hey, not like we can go complex and we can go big and we can we can do so much more. So it started to interest us, though my core at that point was architecture, but I felt that this understanding of geometry was very important. This understanding of skill and material, how it applies to, to the geometry is important. And then by the end of the day, let's say, um, like, do I make a tableware? Do I make a, um, you know, like a furniture piece or an interior space or even architecture? I think then it becomes about, you know, what quality of material is applied to it and what scale of uh, pieces are to be made. So interestingly, uh, because as an architect for me, large scale, like what is understood to be small scale in the product industry, say a furniture piece of one and a half feet by one and a half feet, it's a feet is a decent sized product um, in the furniture industry. We realize that because I did not have the brains to be a furniture designer, I started making all these objects which were actually large scale pieces. For me, say doing a 15 feet, 20 feet piece, or even larger was much easier than doing, let's say, a tableware. So uh, that kind of all of these thoughts and uh, kind of channelized into saying that, hey, let's let's dial back. And in the time of, uh, you know, really high tech machinery, let's let's look at a craft for a new dimension, a new way of exploring uh, you know, innovative design and an innovative product for the market. So um, uh, here, what I'll do is first, I'll take you through a couple of works that I've done and already executed. It's not like the full catalog. I don't think that matters here, but I would want to take you through a few of my products. And then those, the later half of the presentation also talks about what is the vision? Because that is where me and you might be able to connect at the level of how we designers think, how we envision our practices and what we want to, you know, eventually achieve in life. So um, here we are, like there's this, this is one of the initial products that I developed. It's called uh, Topology. Um, the intent of Topology was that this is an undulating, organic, complex geometry, uh, but it's a surface. This surface could be applied to, let's say, a wall paneling. It could be a furniture piece. It could um, be a lighting installation. It could be anything. So the intent is that, you know, uh, and, and it could be of different scales. So uh, every single thing we started doing was this one basic idea that can evolve and grow. And minded, because we are all in the design industry, one thing that always and always a client asks is, is customization. So being a product company, product design plus making company, how do we tackle the challenge and the economics of constantly with every single client trying to create a new design and still not exhaust ourselves with that this, this streamlined vision that we have. So that is where every product that you see is an idea. That idea, that idea of form development, light integration, that detailing can be evolved into, you know, just anything depending upon, you know, the scale of the space, the intent of the interior space or even architecture for that matter. So topology was again, one of the initial products uh, that we did. Now, uh, this is, uh, this, this is one piece that we're really famous for and it's called the Imli Bench. Um, so this is the most interesting piece because this is the first one that we actually made and that this piece was a Eureka moment for us. Uh, when we made the Imli, actually the intent was that uh, um, we wanted to create a piece of nostalgia and uh, just the word Imli 
you know when it popped into my head i was like just the word emily is so much nostalgia you know the childhood the uh, the, the playing around the emily tree or the candy or uh, you know just just so much memory around food uh, in general so that's when we said that how about we just take an emily pod scale it up and then uh, just just let it be and at that point i was exploring 3d printing and cnc based uh, methodology so that you know we could create uh, to create create different objects 3d printing at this scale was actually very is, will be very very expensive not just 5 years back but even today it's going to be very expensive and when we were looking at cnc based systems it was almost like a waffle grid based system i think a lot of you guys must be using a waffle grid system to develop your objects now or or you know just ideas and visions so now when we actually uh, were trying to say that okay how do we save money how do we create something which is actually not just a grid but also a surface because grids don't really give you that flexibility in functionality you might get an overall shape but then how do you make it a functional surface that is very very crucial so as we were brainstorming um, uh, you know we were on the drawing board we said that how about because we're talking about nostalgia let's talk also about a nostalgic material and that's when the idea of cane and rattan cane so um we were like we were we were hopeless like we, we were being hopeless with this as an idea but we said that okay let's let's go let's let's sit with a couple of weavers and see what happens and if you see both the ends of the piece of the piece both the ends are almost like two baskets that kind of provide a starting point of the piece and then they sort of change shape a little bit and go and merge in now uh, for us it was a surprise when the whole production happened in one shot and we actually did work with a very senior a very senior weaver who still is there with us you know working with us for the past 5 years it was it was a beautiful thing that came in front of us because we were thinking like architects and we were like let's look at the properties and the sustainability aspect of what we created now what you see here is a skeleton and skin system so there is a shell which is a skeleton and then there is a skin uh now this 5 feet long piece because the material is just so minimal uh i realized that it's so lightweight that i could pick up the bench and move around single person like you know very very easily second thing we realized that because the surface because it was getting woven uh the material is by itself natural so it is sustainable but then even you know a long strand or a short strand anything could get woven in it so during the methodology of man making this we realized that the wastages were also very minimal and even if there were wastages the wastages were actually biodegradable and when i started comparing this module with that of the waffle system um of making making something like this and maybe a material like plywood or uh, even mdf we realized wastages in the structure making also was uh, you know not there so this piece became a moment not just in terms of the idea of what emily stands for but also how it became an efficient system of making structurally extremely sound but lightweight at the same time and uh, you know it just opened up this whole platform for us they said that if we could do this and take it to a much much further level of you know development of uh, geometry and forms this next project is um, it's called exotic blooming teas it's it's actually an interior project um, in hyderabad that we did um, it, it was by the by pre lab design studio and um, the first time um, we said that hey we want to do a wicker wall and this wall is actually a 21 feet long and 11 feet tall wall we had never done anything of this scale we this scale at that point we never seen anything of this scale at that point but then we were quite excited and as architects we were like let's just make it bigger and larger you know that was always the goal we never wanted to do smaller pieces so uh, this is again that one wall installation that we made um to our surprise a wall that scale all hand woven by a group of four to five weavers took us 15 days to make 
Uh, each panel is extremely lightweight. The internal framing is natural cane and the surface weaving is actually uh, rattan, which is extracted out of cane and it's all hand woven. And um, uh, just the installation of it was so simple. It just took us two hours to install the entire uh, wall panel. So this is the first time we did this large scale piece and then we never looked back. We, we just kept going bigger and bigger in terms of the scale of projects uh, we do. This is um, an installation called Ivy that we did. We were invited by Design by Design 20 under 35. Um, and we were supposed to do another installation. So here again, the idea was modularity, uh, scalability, and creating a product that can keep growing. The idea of Ivy also informed that, you know, the, the, the intent of being able to grow. So we divided it into different modules, small, large and um, of different shapes and uh, this same idea which which you see as an ivy that goes up a wall it can also be um, much much larger installations what you see here is a 13 feet by 4 feet installation but we could even do we, we we've been proposing 30 feet 40 feet long installation in this uh, in, in the IV installation it could be a wall art it could be um, even a light installation it could go on the wall it could go on the ceiling in terms of application and adapt adaptability um, the next project is actually an interesting one um, it was actually the most complex thing that we ever made it's uh, these are curtains that we did for news lab uh, from Mumbai and um, it was again a custom brief and we developed these curtains for them each curtain is 13 feet long and five feet wide and uh, the material is constructed to mimic the natural fall of um, you know of, of, of a gracefully draping uh, curtain this is another project that we did in hyderabad so the image on the left hand side is actually a partition that we did for a jewelry showroom. It's a 16 feet by 8 feet partition. Uh, with, the main structure is made in metal and then intermediate uh, screening is done in uh, natural rattan weaving. So if you compare this to the first product that I showed you, which is the topology, so there the comparison comes that the the topology earlier, which could have been an art piece, now transforms itself into like a large partition. Or this could even be an architecture. It, it could be a facade. It could be like a space divider. It could actually be a structural architectural element. On the right hand side, what you see is that we have paired it up with again an organic uh, uh, three-seater seat and our uh, lifafa chairs in the same space. This is a project that we did uh, last year with Amir, with the studio Amir Hamida in based out of Hyderabad. Um, it is a 30 feet by 30 feet uh, uh, installation in plan. In height, it is six feet installation. There are three strips, strips that roam around in that, that, that that's kind of uh, go around in concentric circles and uh, and develop and grow itself into this whole large uh, ceiling installation. The interesting part is that because it's natural material, it's it's a lightweight material, you could go really, really big in terms of scale, but then you don't have to worry about the structural weight of the installation that you're going to be doing. Uh, the same thing done in any other material, uh, the structural loads would have increased and then the cost of structure would have also increased. Now, um, one of the questions when we when we embarked, when we said that, okay, the company should be named the uh, Wicker Story, by Wicker Story, our intent is weaving and weaving in its different forms and aspects, maybe in terms of research, maybe in terms of business, maybe in terms of uh, uh, even in terms of architecture. So uh, uh, the one question that always came to us was that why only uh, design in weaving why not other materials why am I limiting myself and this is something that a lot of my mentors kept asking me as to you know why do you want to limit yourself and just say that okay I want to only and only work in weaving so uh, we started looking at weaving from different aspects over the last five years not just in terms of making products but also uh, in terms of how do we take different aspects of weaving and start innovating. 
So um, we have done a lot of travel in the last few years to analyze and assess uh, uh, what does weaving mean in the country. And we realize that there are more than 75 different forms of mats and basket making across the country. Traditional weaving techniques originating from humble mats and baskets have left an indelible mark on craft history. And today we have an opportunity to be able to evolve and grow into newer forms of application. So uh, craft innovation is something that has always been a key goal with, for, for us with uh, uh, weaving with vidrat and with cane that as a, as a base materiality. This is not a project done by us, but this kind of also sets a premise where uh, 3D geometry, which could be parametrically driven, but also application with 3D printing and using natural materials with weaving can create very interesting designs in terms of products in uh, products uh, from tableware to furniture to interior spaces. So this provides a very big opportunity to innovate and bring in not just bringing together tech, high tech and low tech uh, manufacturing methodologies uh, together. Uh, this is one collaboration that we did uh, with a brand called uh, Cancel Plants. They're based out of Hyderabad. Uh, Cancel Plants actually works with uh, rejected um, industrial waste from um, um, medical, from medical industry, from uh, plastic industry, and also from condom industry. So. Uh, we were trying to see that how do we work with uh, waste and bring that into manufacturing. So these are a couple of chatai samples actually that we, we worked with them where the silver material that you see is actually the packaging material, the strips uh, the the packaging material has a lot of strip strips cut out and wasted you know that actually goes into dump we took that and we combined it into into these chatais and we've actually applied them into a couple of partition uh, projects where we made partitions and screens in and and screens uh, in this system um innovation yes we did innovation in terms of form making we did innovation in terms of material application we do understand that sustainability is there in terms of material that goes into our products also handcrafting again is a sustainable approach but should we stop there or there is something beyond that so when we uh, when we said that okay what else does sustainability mean you know beyond just you know the basic premise of a company we said that how about uh, having uh, uh, components uh, which are which are two dimensional which are flat which can be made let's say which can be made flat tagged shipped to us from different craft clusters across the country and then uh, folded to generate 3d geometry because 3d geometry is the essential final goal for us in terms of what we create this kind of helped us optimize the even the uh, the carbon um, um, footprint of the transportation part in terms of the manufacturing of the pieces so if you see we took uh, circular chatais we the circular chatais are two dimensional they are they are made two dimensional they are shipped to us uh, from a, a particular craft cluster to us and then we bend them and we mold them into these uh, 3d geometries so uh, we actually won um, lexa design award for craft innovation for this uh, particular project it's called the coral lamps Can you go back? Yeah. So uh, though I've shown this project before, but for us, um, the idea of uh, scale was very important. Uh, we never could deal with small scale pieces. We still don't have a basket in our product catalog. We don't have any tableware in our catalog. Simply put that uh, as architects, we were always thinking about bigger and larger. Um, for us, craft innovation also meant that what we thought was meant only for making furniture could actually be used at a much, much larger scale. Today, uh, we've done these large installations, but we also hope that tomorrow we are able to do much larger interior spaces, molding them end to end from, from seating to wall paneling to ceiling and integrating functionalities like in integrating services into them as well for better functionality. 
Another aspect of innovation in scale for us would be to take the idea of weaving from just a basket to that of a building. The project image that you see on the left is actually from Heatherwick Studio, where they have done weaving in uh, stainless steel. The moment the material is changed, altered, or upgraded, I, uh, the structural properties also, not just... Uh, uh, performance properties, but also structural properties of the material also changes. And we feel that there's a lot of potential of uh, weaving and handcrafting, even in the architectural architecture industry. Uh, the example on the left is a modular system, but then how we have worked over the last few years is actually, yes, modular systems are important, but also how do you not limit yourself in design and create custom bespoke solutions? So that is where we are heading towards and that is what we want to do. One of the underlying aspects of um, working in a craft industry that we felt we were fortunate to is engaging in an industry which is said and looked upon, which was frowned upon, an industry which was sort of considered to be dying in the country. Um, when we first started making the products, people said that firstly, who works in handcrafting industry in the time of tech? And um, uh, you know, there, there, there is no money, there is no future. People were really shun upon buying these products uh, for their homes. Uh, so in our city, Hyderabad, where our manufacturing is, the, the weavers who come to us, uh, most of the weavers are actually the last generation of weavers uh, in their family because they're, the future generation is all aiming towards uh, desk-based, air condition room-based jobs. So there was no pride in what these people were doing. Now, as we started making these designs, it was they, they, they started uh, making better things. They started making larger objects. They started refining their skills. There was better quality that we were able to deliver. Uh, beyond a point, we realized that what was a negative feeling inside them actually turned into a very positive aspiration where they now feel extremely confident that they are doing works of uh, great, great value. They are contributing to an industry and this is not an industry that is going to, that is going to demise. So that is a very important thing that we were able to do. Plus, uh, because it became a successful product for the market, for us, we grew and for, with us, these weavers also started to grow with us, which meant, which also meant that the equation of the monetary equation for them, reliable, reliability on somebody for regular source of income that, that stabilized for them. Uh, we started, we were able to pay our weavers better because we were able, we were getting more complex work done and we created a value for that in the market. So essentially, uh, for us, the biggest learning was that with the right quality of design input, you can create a market for anything and everything and also give the right quality of livelihoods that where people can see a future for themselves. So, um, so, and this is something that we feel that there is a lot more work from us that can go into. Today, we have managed to create beautiful systems of working, cleaner working conditions for them. And we would like to grow further in terms of how we address it, not just in terms of weavers engaging with, with us, but also maybe craft clusters across the country. As I said previously, also, as I said, uh, one second, as I said previously, also that for us, uh, the idea of economic sustenance also also leads to an organizational uh, setup, organizing the idea of the, like rather streamlining the idea of how how craft. How, how craft people work, what quality of workspaces do they come to, what systems do they come, uh, what, what uh, systems do they work under, uh, are they getting medical benefits or not, are they getting re regular pay for their, for, the, for their work, and a, a lot more. So I think that is, that is the part of it we've been able to do, and that also establishes future goals uh, for us within our purview. Now, how relevant is craft today? I mean, we when five years back I started, I think nobody was talking about craft. Nobody was working in craft. Uh, today, thankfully, there's been a lot of takers, especially a, a lot of takers, a lot of activism with respect to craft. 
but i think us as designers have a much better and a bigger challenge which is that not just supporting craft i feel supporting craft would essentially mean accepting craft for the way it is today and 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 trying to find a market but we need to understand that the times are changing and us as designers can actually bring in a lot of change understanding better design with respect to that craft or innovating that whole system altogether so craft is relevant there is a market beyond india there is a much bigger market but i think it's about how do we tackle how do we look at a 360 degree purview of craft from design to the business to the quality of service that we actually give in the industry so um, and and we are the right people actually uh, to undertake that um so uh, in terms of perceiving our practice i feel that uh, um big uh, in architecture we are taught to research we are taught to be thorough uh, with respect to the material aspect the structural aspect the uh, the, un- the understanding of client to the deliverability aspect and that has kind of helped me in structuring how we look at a product based company where we operate like a, a design studio there is a design studio and then there is a manufacturing and the two work closely hand in hand and we feel that uh, a divergent methodology has helped us grow till the point today and stay relevant in terms of uh, the intent of what woven works can do and create so that is the goal so different divergent methodologies uh, that have helped is one is uh, machinic processes that can aid craft so we are looking at uh, developing small little machine systems uh, tech based system can craft be innovated and maybe not craft maybe not as a whole but small little parts and aspects of craft how can it be innovated made more efficient made more made to facilitate the work of of a weaver to be able to create uh, uh, better design uh, you know and more complex design uh we have looked at parametric design for and with sustainability parametric design though it's complex geometry doesn't necessarily mean that our, our end product has to be unsustainable in fact whatever we have been able to create has thoroughly throughout the journey been sustainable and that has been our goal so future of design doesn't necessarily mean uh, you know uh, unsustainable uh, practices uh research has become integral part of our of our practice because we need to constantly explore at new dimensions it could be from um uh from it, it could be from the aspect of different material uh, interrogation in material uh, studies to interrogation on skill to interrogation also on form finding so research has been consistent in our practice and that may or may not be applicable into the end product that we sell but then that does inform us the relevance and importance of what we're doing now efficiency in process of products to be able to be market ready that has been important because that is what the business is what facilitates any research and uh, any research or design thought and we've been able to create a research design based practice while at the same time creating a a sustain um, financially sustainable system so all these divergent methodologies have kind of built the practice that we are today and uh, i would say that uh, we did not when we when we when we started when we started out we did not actually know where we are going to be but we gave ourselves 10 years and we said that the design and craft innovation is is key to what we're doing in 5 years we've seen ourselves being able to come to a juncture where we are happy in terms of the product that we offer and we feel that 10 years we be we will be able to research more and bring together better works so um that's about us um thank you so much thank you oh thank you thank you thank you that's uh, interesting <laughs> uh, to listen to the uh, your journey through this uh, so to say the idea of uh, weaving as a uh, weaving as a process and the material from architecture background how how you are traveling and what is your uh, 
what is the journey going to be kind of in the last future as so what we were uh, speaking about um if if i i would just request uh, the other listeners to put the questions in the chat and uh, till that i have was one one question which uh, i'm interested in now it's it's very uh, let's say it's not a it's a very different material and different approach altogether you don't have a physical mm -hmm. so for this kind of a things to be done so the my question is how, what is the uh, process on which you work if, if you want to design something like in you know, architecture i can say if we sketch a thing we draw the certain way you know, plan section elevations and then we produce it to the contractor who can read us so those but in your case how right. does this happen like how do you sketch because you said on the one one side you are working with this grasshopper and rhino and 3d which is very right. technologically advanced on the other side the craftsmen who they know the weaving at their best right. and then how do you how do you make this communication from the design complex design which comes out of your the software to the craftsman who is actually building it right uh, that's an interesting question because i think a lot of us uh the moment we decide to innovate on something innovating on drawing board is easy but then the moment you take it try to take it on the ground beat my craft people or beat a contractor on site i think uh there's always and always a push back and inhibition from the people who are actually going to be making uh um, making things now for us um a couple of things that have played played like you know that have worked that we have, we have understood that has worked with us one is that when you're talking to a craft person you need to talk to them in their language you need to talk to them in the way they understand it now let's say i have a person who does framing um some people do very complex framing some people do very simple framing then i have weavers with me weavers also some are extremely skilled some are not so skilled so for us it's very very important to understand every very every craft person's temperament firstly and for us then the next step is that the quality of information that we give to a person we never say that hey here's my design this is what it looks like now you make it it's your headache that has never worked for me in my architecture practice that has never worked for me in my in my even in my product and design uh, practice today so for us it becomes very important that how the design studio functions let's say we design something we develop and detail it with respect to a client and the requirement uh, the whole thing needs to be translated into information specific bifurcated sets of informations for framing for weaving for let's say we we play in color patterns so there's a whole color study there are printouts and colors there's a lot of micro management that's involved so design studio has to be hands on design studio needs to bifurcate information and be present with a weaver to ensure that you know what we need is 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 actually achieved now um, the one thing that has helped is that um, we because of what we created it was very new in the market we managed to pay our weavers better also and in the process people who been joined with us since day one are still with us are still working with us even today which means that it's important that us as designers or architects when we are innovating when we are innovating in a specific uh, trajectory for us uh, a trained team team who has been around with you specifically working on that thing is very very important say for the for for example let's say even wall makers window daniel you know the way he innovates he innovates a lot with materials and he creates these beautiful buildings but then the team of contractors and builders are are constant throughout the different projects so um, these two aspects one is uh, sorting information being hands on uh not fearing from sitting in the workshop sitting with the weavers sitting with them so uh, that aspect has really really uh, helped us so for us we can never be a sh showroom and a manufacturing we will always be a design studio and a manufacturing and the manufacturing i call it manufacturing because now we have converted a um, um 
a cottage industry scale thing into like a proper factory with organized systems so uh, these two things work parallelly and both are equally relevant in terms of uh, communication of design and communication of intent also between a client to a viewer to actual deliverability thank you and and just uh, one more things to add to it is uh, like the whole in this whole process of like a weaver or a craftsman would have their way to see this material becoming the basket and the, the way you have been saying this this thing and then you you are pushing them to do certain use of some different scales and different uh, completely different forms of this weaver and how yeah. does that uh, that in turns um inform their technique of craftsmanship so means there I, i i believe there must be a certain kind of a weaving patterns and the weaving things which 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 generally goes with a certain kind of a um, surface or the undulations and all these things and do they have invent invented a new way of weave pattern because you have pushed to a certain certain kind of a geometry to achieve because i'm sure you as you showed there is a there is a set of weaving patterns that they know but there yeah. might be a is, was there any time uh, in in your project or in your uh, practice happened that they they were been asked to detail in a different way like for a weave in a different way let's say right so um there are two aspects of works that we could be doing one is three dimensional work the other is two dimensional work in three dimensional work we realize that because there's complexity in terms of form so what we do is that we keep our weaves simplified so if you see my weaves are actually just a warp and weft weave which is like two weaves uh, material going into two perpendicular directions and then there is just a movement in material how it forms and grows and develops so in three dimensional geometry uh, the intervention on innovation or push in design is largely very studio based and information that goes is also studio based and a craft person is actually not able to innovate on weave because the moment weave complexity comes as an additional layer 3d geometry actually goes for a toss the other aspect is that um, the two dimensional chatai two dimensional chatai is actually the core of what these weavers have always known most of their lives actually so the three dimensional geometry is something that we have innovated we pushed and we keep innovating on it but whenever we let's say let's say that one project which i showed you where um we collaborated with cancel the uh, plans to use uh, industrial waste now that as a project is where our weavers were able to now innovate so we give them raw material and we say that okay you know why don't you mix a little bit of rattan a little bit of uh, you know the stainless steel aluminum uh, sorry aluminum strips and then start creating different kinds of chatai that you know so there is in in that case i think for us when whenever we have set a brief they've actually been able to innovate so two dimensional aspects yes there's innovation from them three dimensional aspect because geometry is so complex they're not able to like it's it's mostly now getting trained and then production that is usually the cycle of work thank you thank you hi um so uh, prinka like uh, in in your for like the first note which we discussed about your talk uh, uh we spoke about how the act of weaving can be once can kind of create one small basket basket as well as kind of be expanded to the scale of a building and uh, you know have an entire envelope of the building come up uh, uh through that process uh and you have a parallel architecture studio which which uh, works uh, on architectural projects so uh what i would like to know is uh, how does how do these two practices talk to each other like is is this act and the process of weaving kind of somewhere in forming an architectural form or some experimentation with the material which is being used in practice uh which is which is at a scale which is not uh, not necessarily the object scale but it goes into uh, the scale of form making or space making and uh, are there conversations uh, 
between these two practices and uh, where do we see these two practices then coming together in the long run right um firstly i think the architecture practice kind of keeps me grounded because um as a product company uh, a product company moves really fast like you know in terms of the number of orders that you do to the number of people that you interact with to actually like we are in a fast economy right now you know you really need to talk about numbers and growth every single day so it is very easy for a product company to say that design takes a back seat and then the business in its entirety becomes the main objective now uh, the design company the design studio we are as i said that our operations internally are is also a design studio my design studio works very very closely you know it's it's a com- one common space for the architecture studio also to come together so uh, where the actual um, idea and engagement between the two also happens is is the aspect of research for me one of the biggest insecurities has been since day one because a lot of my mentors told me that how will you stay relevant you know beyond nobody could imagine me 5 years down the line people said that okay you know like how much can you make in wicker how much can you make in weaving based works so for me that was one of the biggest inse- insecurity and also it also set a vision for me that um we need to keep talking to the material we need to keep talking to the skill and say that how does let's say how, how do you do more form finding how do you do different kinds of material application how do you look at different kind of kind of structural properties um uh, so these factors became very important so what we do also is that you know whenever we have interns in the architecture domain in the in the product domain we actually sit with them and we assign this one aim of uh weaving let's say let's say um you know the 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 coral lamp that i showed which where we had won the lexus design craft uh, innovation award there the intent there the intent of innovation was uh, addressing the challenges of expensive transportation in objects which are you know large and bulbous and 3d that's something that we actually face because you know i started like my products are innovative people love it and then the more business we do the more we know that transportation is expensive transportation costs a lot more carbon footprint so now that became a challenge where we said that okay you know like we would love to sit with interns and give them a brief that can a chatai create a chatai which is a 2d thing can a 2d to 3d happen and 3d to 2d happen and can that give us innovative uh, can a can 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 that give us innovative design uh, solutions to um, uh, you know like to be able to create different products and that's how you know it became a whole cycle of uh, form finding we did paper models we we in fact took it like a complete design studio something that you would spend like 6 months in a design studio where you have uh there's a lot of paper model exploration you know like there are small components made components are joined together and then eventually you build like a large larger larger system and that system can be so we 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 we're innovating and we're researching on the system now that system could be applied to a chatai that system could also be applied to maybe you know stainless steel sheets and you could even apply it to a different scale altogether so uh now this becomes this research becomes quite integral not just for us to inform us about material get a better grip on it but also to create more objects that can in future may and or may not be integrated into our economic cycle of sales and production so this uh, the the research factor is where both the both the teams come together the architecture and the and the product design team come together um and you know we are able to uh, think better and envision better for ourselves i mean uh, so just to extend uh, this can you hear me yes i can yeah uh so just to extend uh, uh this a bit further like when we talk about weaving with different materials like right now extensively the research has been uh cane and uh, okay. that's the material right. which we have been working with now when we right. when we talk about uh, weaving say with stainless steel sheets or say plates 
Uh, now there the material properties and uh, what the material has to offer comes in. Um, are there any experiments which uh, which you've actually tried uh, working on with different materials with hybrid of cane with uh, some other material which is much more denser, stiffer, uh, which is difficult to weave and how does that work? Like, are there any experiments which have which are happening currently in the studio with with that? So, um, circling back to that, uh, the aluminium weaving sample that I showed you, that was one example where we took metal uh, in a very, very thin sheet, uh, merged with that in, and then wove these chatais. And these chatais are actually very, very sturdy and very strong. That was one experiment that we did. The next one that we also did was that the same weaving format, we, we instead of using a natural uh, material, we actually use stainless steel wires. So whatever designs that you see in three-dimensionality, now we are able to create all of those designs in stainless steel weaving. And um, apart from that, I think what interests me also is in using waste material, let's say plastic, uh, plastic can be used to make uh, 3D printing filaments and these 3D printing filaments are actually perfect for us to weave. So plastic based weaving is is, is, is an interesting premise for us. Um, additionally, I feel that, see the interesting part about weaving and what we do is that one, there is a skeleton which is a frame and then there is a surface which is a warp and weft. Okay, warp and weft is like essentially material going into two different directions. It can be the same material or it can be two different types of materials. Now for me, even using, let's say paper, something like paper, paper in varying thicknesses, paper as a composite, let's say paper integrated with, let's say a little stainless steel wire, where you're not using extensive amount of stainless steel, but you know, it's largely paper. It could be reinforced in thread. It could be reinforced in thin stainless steel wire. That in itself is a premise for a very strong material. So a lot of material type, it's a skill is constant. A lot of material typologies can be applied. Uh, some we have worked with, let's say we've also worked with very thin wooden strips to be able to create uh, partition systems, very sturdy partition system. We want to apply it to furniture application also because uh, by the end of the day, uh, sustainability is impacted by the quantum of material that you go. Uh, that, that that goes into constructing something. So for us, minimizing wastage is important and then minimizing the material gone into building something is also important. Weaving provides me that. So a very wide array, wide spectrum of materials are actually applicable and provides a big future for us. Uh, hi, uh, we have one question on our chat. So I will just read it to you. It's uh, from Suman Majundra. And um, she asks, in today's world, we always ask people to please buy some craft made things to support our craft person. But how okay. to create the situation like we no need to push the customers to buy. Instead, they itself ask for it and create a demand for craft, craft based design. And, and in the and product in this modern gadgets and AI based technological mm -hmm. world. So I think what she's saying is in today's this uh, with a lot of uh, electronics and uh, gadgets and AI coming right. into, the, into the market. How do you make this uh, product relevant for the today's world? Um, <coughs> sorry. Um, so. Sorry for that. Um, so um, in architecture, when I was in college, I was passionate about sustainable design. And I was trying to study works done in bamboo work, um, in rammed earth construction, in uh, compressed earth blocks and ferrous cement. And I realized that the design typology that was happening a few years before to that point or in the future, it's all going to be the same. So one is as designers understanding that what is good design being able to create good design but at the same time we need to understand that we are in a changing time and the times are changing really really fast so if our if our craft if our if our product is not able to rise up to the challenges and needs of today 
if they're not able to give an innovative solution, which is customer oriented, space oriented, but also to the modern aesthetic, uh, that particular craft, that particular strategy is not going to work at all. So uh, because I had worked with these uh, sustainable design studios at one point, one of my biggest um, uh, issue with them was that, yes, we talk about good design, but can we talk about innovation? Can we look at material? Can we see what are the material properties and really push the boundary on materiality? What next are we creating in sustainable design? Just saying that we want to create something sustainable, just saying that we are going to work in craft, just having a good intention towards craft and the craft people today is not enough. I think real real work needs to happen. One needs to really sit down. Let's say if you're interested in a particular craft, you really need to sit down with them. You need to understand the material, the processes. A lot of these processes are, are actually very challenging with respect to where a craft person is, the quality of lifestyle he lives, quality of livelihood that he's able to generate for himself. There are a lot of ground reality problems that need to be looked at and innovated at. So I would say that one way is that, you know, like, temporarily saying that okay hey let me support a particular craft but till the time there's no graph there, there's no intervention on the grassroots level in terms of the processes and addressing why something is not working in today's time i think uh, just an intent for working in craft is is not uh, sufficient because it is not going to sustain we are talking about craft which has survived us, which has been around for at least 100 years. And we are talking about the demise of that craft maybe in the next 5 to 10 to 20 years. And, we, and, and this demise, we are talking about not just one craft, but we are talking about across the board. Let's say, for example, in basketry. Okay, so there is a... Uh, like my previous workshop, we were surprised at a couple of women who were living close to us uh, just and these are housemaids these women are actually housemaids now so they would keep walking by our workshop they would just one day they walked in they sat down they picked up a couple of uh, you know like these globe lights that we were making and just like fada fada they started to weave on it and we were surprised so they then they, they then told us that all of them are actually weavers they come from a weaver community which is closer to Hyderabad now, Hyderabad as a city has provided, like not for them, but for the future generation opportunity to work in the IT sector. And so, you know, the entire family, and not just entire family, but the entire cluster has left the village. There is not a single person doing reading anymore. Everybody is in the city trying to find a better future for their children. So economies are growing at a very, very fast pace. Temporary solutions will not work. Serious interventions are needed. Something that because I had worked in sustainable design in architecture and I always had a problem that why can't we find more innovative, sustaining solutions to offer to a client? So that was my problem there. And I think that intent I had applied to Wicker also. And we were able to create a new product. And today also when we talk to the market, we don't just say that, hey, I have these five lamps in my catalog. You buy, you buy, you don't buy, you don't buy. And, and none of these designs that we've created have got anything to do with what has been happening for the last 20, 30 years. So one, with the design that we're offering, we are able to offer a new and unique solution to architects and interior designers for their projects, but also at the same time offering customization solutions. So we, in terms of operations, also we run as a design studio along with, you know, the manufacturing. So just a holistic thinking in terms of where and what all aspects does one in a way to make sure you're relevant and not just for a year or two, but actually really sustain. So that is that is important. So by the end of the day, it is money for the company. It is it is better pay for weavers. And if people if weavers find that economic sustenance and growth for themselves and their families, craft will go grow and it will keep growing. So that is the real um, uh, solution that needs to be done. Uh, thank you, Prima. Thanks. Uh, as just there's a Coming from this uh, architectural background and all, I would like to ask one: how 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 you see the precision in the whole process? Like, if you know if you know in the with like as as you said, with the 
3D printing and CNC, the things are becoming more and more precise as the technology is growing right. up. And this somehow idea of all the design is also striving to become a more precise in that sense and efficient right. and all this thing. Right. With the whole dimension of the craft and the craftsman do this. I'm just I'm just curious, like if you design like per se that Emily bench, if you design in a certain way, how was it on to the let's say on on the software or, or in the sketchbook and how did it translate it because of a certain forces of the craft itself? So how is the idea of a precision which is taken care in the whole process, I would say? So uh, the architectural practice taught me one to make a lot of drawings and be interested in drawings. So communication and architectural practice is very important. Communication between a design studio to the end contractor to ensure or any any lack in that communication essentially means that your end result is going to be impacted. Secondly, architectural practices also teach you to be meticulous in terms of your quality checks. These two aspects, I think, uh, uh, integrated into our system of practice, where we create a lots, we create lots and lots and lots of drawings, simplify information that's given to a weaver. But that simplified information is actually we're able to create very, very precise uh, products. So we may have started with, at one point, with designs and products where our design, what we executed, with uh, deviated by uh, maybe 20 to 30 percent. Today, five years down the line, with training, with the right quality of information translation between the studio and the and the manufacturing, I would very proudly say that you know our deviations would be anything between zero to five percent let's say one to five percent i think that's the maximum amount of deviation though it is a craft-based process does but making it into an organized system system of uh, communication running a design studio with the practice there's constant quality check all of these things as a part of the overall system of operation has helped us ensure that though it is craft it is a precise product by the end of the day we want to fit into the market and we don't want to be undermined just because we are craft. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, one more question uh, from Aditya Bolte. Yeah. He, he's asking, in, in what ways do you foster a culture of innovation among the workers you collaborate with? And how does this approach influence the development of new techniques or material in your work? Um, so, um, I think uh, we love taking interns. Uh, we, love, we love taking long-term interns, especially because I feel that somebody uh, coming from a college to a design studio, okay, there is there is a lack of practical understanding of the industry, but a lot of enthusiasm towards the theoretical aspect of or approach towards design exploration, I would say that's the term. So what we usually do is we put in a brief, like we also, because we've been working in, in the industry for so long, we are also looking at problems and challenges, you know, that we encounter through our journey. So we, we develop these small little briefs and whenever we have an intern, we always start an intern to orient them also to our work. We start them with, let's say, this one small project. And uh, uh, let's say the, um, say, weaving with wood, with wooden strips and not just, and, and, we, and exploring wooden strips as modules, modules that can grow into larger systems but also three dimensionality is important and what are the typologies and what are the different ways and types of growing so like like that that becomes a brief for example now we don't ask them to begin by making a product we don't say that it has to sell sell uh, we very specifically tell them that it does not have to be a light it does not have to be a furniture it does not have to be a partition it does not have to be anything it just is all about material uh what can the material do let's just talk about that once we know what can the material do uh we talk about the scalability of that idea once scalability is in place we talk about can we talk about some details joints and uh, you know like details could be in wood details could be in metal and also then we talk about sourcing you know sourcing systems once this is sort of you know researched that 
it gives us a base to see that now is the idea viable for us to make a product what is that type of a product and shall we take it to the market or not so uh, research has to be research research can't be like that okay uh, like also like one thing if you see in our practice is that like most of the uh, most of the product companies would always come up with a collection like every 6 months or a year till now we we've, we we've, we've been able to free ourselves from that and say that hey we will keep researching and whenever we have the right product we will bring it to the market so we we tried keeping ourselves away from that pressure of how a typical company works and said that let research be important and the goal of the research is not to create a product but to create an idea so this is what sets the premise for ideas and there is no pressure in terms of translating it into sellability uh the one one more question from from uh, prasad khanolkar uh, he is saying very interesting work and thanks can you tell us a bit about the some of your failed experiment which don't end up as a product necessarily and what are the learnings from there um so by fail experiments you do you mean in wicker story or generally as a as an architect or designer like overall uh and uh one more question uh prasad kamal tari asking uh, so there seems to uh, the two kinds of work one where the view almost distorts the existing form a uh, chair melts or a wall pinches and other where the view mimics the existing form like like a imli i would say are these intentional and are there other such experiments uh can i go back to the previous question actually i did not answer the previous question can i do that about the failed experiment you mean yes yes yeah he uh, prasad is asking your voice is gone milan ji so i okay. think there's some connection yeah. problem let so me I... let me answer both the questions maybe yes hmm? yes <laughs> so i would say that um wicker story did happen after a lot of failed experiments already so we whatever failures we were having we were having all of that in the in the product company and uh, wicker story we took it at a, a step at a time so rather than failure it was always about uh, let's say we created one thing then when we were going to the next thing we said that hey let's push it a little more and then another thing let's push it a little more so wicker story became a very systematic growth methodology research whatever we did research is a an entity by itself so we never looked at research from a point of view of success or failure research and and also understand that as a company there are two aspects i'm talking about one is the research the other is sellability and creating a product catalog that can actually go into the market so to create a product that's actually viable for the market and actually makes money for the company um it requires time for to be able to embed that idea into the market being able to create a wider range and then come to the point that it is a successful product but research i feel is never a failure research of any kind will inform you something or the other about what work like the way you it is important to know what works similarly it is very important to also know what does not work so if you come to a conclusion from something that this does not work doesn't mean it's a failure but it is a part and parcel of your actual you know uh, that that overall research that you're doing so this is what wicker story is so i'll not i'll say that we never had failed um experiments in wicker story but before we started wicker story um uh, in the architecture practice apart from the architecture works that we were doing i let's say first project that i did was one as, you know as an experimental project was the sensor driven uh, you know the art installation the goal of that was to say that okay in a few years can we have uh, uh, architectural components or elements that could actually shape ship but i realized that the failure there was that i it was too high tech it was advanced for its time i don't think even today in india we will have 
takers for shape shifting building elements i don't think that's going to happen soon anytime soon but at the same time i realized that i was an architect and for an innovation like that you need the right kind of team where an engineer and an architect comes together comes to the drawing board and actually is able to create a workable product so the construction of a company the the way we were like we were all architects that as a system did not work and i think that was one failing point uh, the next project that we did was the 3d printed jewelry suite series it started because i said that okay hey sensor based design is not working and it's a lot of investment and you know i don't think we're going to be able to do it then let's get into 3d printed uh, let's get into 3d printing and i wanted to do 3d printing arch- in architecture or 3d printing in product and at that point of time again uh, it was very expensive the cost of 3d printing then was expensive and it is still expensive now so when we did the jewelry series also i think the failing point there was not being able to balance the economics of manufacturing so i call it, i don't know so i don't know if it's a failure or not but at least i will say whatever we did was a learning for us because when by the time we came to uh, wicker story we said that we need to maybe talk about at least something that is a little low tech somewhere and it was just the right equilibrium for us you know design aspiration to how we were making thing and it became a product that was apt for the market then it was apt for the market 5 years back it was it is apt for the market today but let's say 3d printing or sensor based design or machinic intervention in craft processes i think all these will circle back into the practice somewhere maybe 5 years down the line where what i'm doing today will not be enough innovation for tomorrow there will be a lot happening how do we as a company stay relevant and say that this is my mission statement and we are going to survive so all those failed experiments from the past are going to help us innovate better in wicker store thanks um i'll take up the next uh, question um it is from path kulcharekar um he asked when you talk about basketry or forms out of tensile fibers how much do computational softwares hold an agency over the partial imagination does the software capac- uh, capabilities influence these demand- imaginations i think um as i said that we've been very systematically growing growing systematically growing in terms of a design aspiration to what we could do now um computational design is a is a very very big subject i mean there's a lot that you can do but for us one big important aspect here was that setting up a workshop having weavers work with us uh there is like uh, training them into doing simpler things in the beginning and then seeing how do we push the boundary so every time there was a there was a goal which was a step ahead and that goal was determined and det- defined by what my weavers could do and what they could do next so uh computational geometry i feel that for us let's say the idea of computational design is is a fragment of the work that we do but let's say a larger exploration in computational design is actually not a part of the company because for us it is it is informing backwards the the craft the weaver that informs us what next can we do true um yeah we'll we'll take up uh, the next question um from manoj dada uh, he asks architecture and product design often ends up catering largely to the luxury sector given that you are using very simple material and sustainable methods how can your ideas with weaving cane help the underprivileged if at all could there be an open source version of your product which people could make it themselves um these are two different questions actually it's not the same question we'll talk about i think i would want to talk about open source design separately and um, i would want to let's say uh, talk about uh, product for underprivileged and um, versus product for a luxury market 
I would say that my product in the current system is actually a product for the luxury market and it's actually not a product for the masses. Uh, the simple point here is that my material may be simple, but then let's say when we started, but, but, but for, for us, the kind of work that we do, there's a lot of demand on customized pieces. So for every weaver who is creating something, every other day is a new design. It's a new product. Whereas a traditional understanding of craft would be that craft is a form of livelihood. It is one thing that they've learned from the previous generation and then they're trying to make a livelihood out of it, which means that the expanse in terms of what they create, the kind of designs that they create is a very fast moving system. Let's say a family of weavers creating a type of baskets. These are going to be simple baskets and they're going to be making hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of those pieces. So the economics and, and, and also there is no organized setup there. There is no factory expense. There's no design studio expense. So it's a very simple, clean, basic system. And that's why they're also able to create products for masses that are cheaper and available in the market and anybody can buy it. For us, the moment we start talking about design innovation, the moment we start talking about an organized setup of, let's say, a large factory infrastructure, larger, larger infrastructure costs, and providing a, a solution-based design, which means that there is one base typology, but then from one project to the other, let's say the designs are different. So then it completely breaks the idea that of, of, of that kind of an economics. In fact, my production cost in itself becomes a very high factor and that starts to reflect in the overall cost. Every product becomes bespoke. Every product becomes like a art piece in itself. Pieces become like collector's pieces and does the cost. Like I don't have a large part of, like there is no in between for me. It's not that I can reduce the cost a little and find a much larger market. So for me, my market will only be that much and we are able to give a good solution and a good product to them. So in fact, we are in the luxury market. I feel intervention can happen, say, for example, uh, definitely there's a lot of scope, say, where you sit with, uh, where you introduce designs, which are innovative, but again, simple, and you work with a craft cluster. And these designs start to go into the market through them on a regular basis. Now, that is going to be a serious intervention where there is design innovation, but that is designed for masses. We have not yet been able to do, unfortunately. Uh, we've not we, we've tried a hand on it, but we've still not been able to do. But let's hope that that kind of an intervention, we or you, know, you guys are able to bring in that enthusiasm and actually bring about that kind of a change. Um, addressing the second part about um, uh, open source design, I feel that like I, I've been giving it, I, I've given it actually like a lot of thought. I feel that weaving is um, not weaving as an idea is not a machining process. It is a skill based process. So the bigger question is, can a skill be open source? So let's say if a skin can, skill can be open source, let's say then, you know, I mean, a tutorial on a basket making anybody can do it but not everybody has a caliber to do it or not everybody has an interest to do it. So now understanding what that, but that skill is complex, that skill needs to be, you need to be meticulous at it. So keeping the skill part and the material part separate, I feel that how about a thought process where it's a hybrid system. Um, say one of the examples that we had shown was actually these um, 3D printed uh, sort of uh, uh, pen stands and then these 3D printed pen stands actually had these um, slots where your material could go through. Now, say, uh, so now that is a hybrid system where you're saying that a manual material is, is combined with a 3D printed uh, object. And that 3D printed object already provides guidelines for the, the manual material to engage with. So an idea like that, I feel is a great place to maybe start thinking about open source in, in let's say even rattan based uh, design. So there is, so when, when we're talking, let's say about an idea like this, I feel that hundreds and hundreds of idea that we can sit and talk and brainstorm. And I feel that for us, um there's only so much we can do so we take the we, we we always say that it's always like you take a step at a time so maybe open source is is a great aspect of research that needs to be thought and talked about 
um so definitely that can happen but it is going to be i feel the most efficient way to look at it is going to be a hybrid system where components in 3d printing in laser cutting in cnc that component can engage with rattan as a raw material and instruction is simple straightforward and you know anybody anywhere can actually design make and assemble and uh, build it themselves thank thank priyanka i'm just going to check if there are any questions on youtube Mm, no, I don't think we have more questions. I think, uh, yeah, I think thank thanks a lot. Thank uh, thank you because it was it was quite kind of interesting to see um uh someone who's been an architect trained as an architect uh doing having a parallel architectural practice uh getting into a crafts uh the craft of weaving and then working with material. um and how these materials are now being you know like products in the market and uh somewhere how practice also kind of gets um uh influenced or uh, rather directed by what uh, the market demands uh, to a certain extent so uh so uh, that was nice uh, uh we were very happy to have you here with us um with this um talk uh, we've come to actually the end of this uh, semester c conversation uh, which was about exploring various technological practices and the idea of rias uh, for all these practitioners so we had six speakers uh, from across the globe and uh, the series opened up the world of rias and practice uh, in a very different way for each of them uh, how each of them worked with material how they almost uh, shaped very unique rhythms of through repetition and different densities and uh, experimentation with different materials and though riyas and practice is seen as a very repetitive process each iteration and repetition uh, brings about that shift and this shift is not necessarily uh, very tangible it, it's more figurative more experiential and much more personal like you almost advance your own self as you uh, repeat and and riyas and do a practice uh, with different materials or with any matter for that uh, um uh any any form of matter and uh, uh, i think this brings us to a threshold where we also reflect and rethink with our own processes and what is the co context uh, around us which is shaping what we are uh, thinking and producing uh so it makes us uh, almost uh, advance in a more, much more informed manner so through these actually three months the discussions involved uh, the role of emotions memories social and cultural context and the role in practice and riyas and we saw that they were somewhere challenging the conventional uh, notions um i think through all the six conversations and uh, discussions we saw riyas and practice move beyond the logics of production somewhere uh with this on behalf of school of environment and architecture we would like to thank you for being with us through this series and i thank you priyanka for being here as our last speaker for the talk uh we will soon um i announce our next c series which will be scheduled in the month of june uh the monsoon cycle uh with this uh, i call this session as a close thank you thank you deepthi for having me here you guys have been a wonderful mm -hmm. audience <laughs> thank you joel we could close the session for today yeah yeah thank you thanks priyanka thank i'm